Hello, friends and enemies, heroes and villains. Welcome to Epic Realms. Our guest today is an actor, author, and audiobook narrator. He's narrated over 300 books, such as Hyperion and the R.A. Salvatore books, not to mention his own book, Certainty. Please welcome Victor Bavine to Epic Realms. How are you doing? Hey, Nick. I'm great, man. Happy to be here. It's great having you here. We've had a handful of authors that you've done books for in the past recently on the show. And it's it's super awesome to have you here. Um, and you've done a lot of audiobooks. And I want to ask you straight up about the name Max Belmore, because this came up on my, my kind of looking a little bit deeper into your history. And I'm like, wait, wait, he has another audiobook name? You want to tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, well, early on in my audiobook career, um, I was offered a romance series. And um, if you know what romance novels are, they're basically, in general, softcore porn for women. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I, I'd already had a bunch of kind of family. I think I'd, I don't know if I'd started doing Bob's books yet, but I had, a, you know, an, enough of the, enough family sort of titles that I wanted to protect my listeners. So, and I'd always been curious, I'd heard what the, how you come up with your porn name is like your first pet and the first street you lived on okay. and mine worked perfectly, which was Max Belmore. <laughs> I just thought it was a great name. And um, so I went with Max Belmore and Max Belmore, and it turns out this series that I do, it's called um, Lords of the Underworld by a woman named uh, Gina Showalter. And she's a really good writer and they're, they're really high quality. They're not your average romance books. But I've been nominated four times for Audis. Audis are like the, you know, the Oscars of audiobooks. Yeah. But I've only been nominated as Max Belmore. And I've always like, I've always like imagined if I won going up and saying and accepting for Max Belmore. <laughs> Victor Bavine. Um, so, uh, yeah. So anyway, so that's that's uh, that's Max. How did you go? You know, how do you how, what's the process on that when you're like doing audiobooks and they come up to you as Victor, who's been writing, reading these other books and they go, hey, you want to do these? And you're like, yeah, but I want to do it under this name or do they suggest it to you? Yeah, well, they, they always give you, a, you, you the publishers always give you an option of using a pseudonym when you sign the contract. If you want to do a pseudonym, they let you, you know, they ask you. But that's really the only romance that I do. Okay. And um so it's saved for Max Bell for, for for those those Lords of the Underworld books. And I've done about I did almost as many as them as I have of Bob Salvatore's books. I've done probably thirty of them. Okay. Um they're not anywhere near as good as Bob's books, though. So. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but um Well, they're different a, they're a different type different, of book. It's a different genre. It's yeah, a different completely different genre. Different genre. Yeah. Do you enjoy being able to bounce back and forth between genres of books when you're when you're doing audiobooks? I, I love it. I love um, it's just basically if it's a good book, it's fun, whether it's nonfiction, fiction. Um, I, I love the opportunity, you know, doing fantasy books are great because you get to really have more, much more fun with the voices and funny accents. And whereas, and, you know, or, or a normal, normal literary uh, work or or a, um, a nonfiction like I did. Um, and, and I was really proud of this when I did. Uh, there's a book called Gotham, which is a 5,000 page history of New York City. It won the Pulitzer Prize. Oh, okay. And I did that. It took me four months. And um, but you can imagine it's pretty dry. I mean, it's really well written and, and yeah. very interesting. But it's you know you don't get to come up with funny voices. You know you have to, you have to keep things pretty straight. Do you have a director for those that are like, oh, you can you liven it up here? Or can you? you know, tone it down there? Most, like you know, used to be pretty um, standard that you had a director. Uh, pretty much the only the only people who do that now is Penguin Random House still does that. Uh, mostly you just have an engineer and sometimes they'll give you, it depends on how much license you give them to, you know, I, like I'll, I'll tell them a few things. If I start, if I start sounding like I'm going on automatic pilot, please tell me. Um, and uh, but generally, you know, you're you're self-directing at this point. But it, it's really great to have like when I did my book, Certainty, it was a brilliance and they had a director for me. And it's great to have somebody else listening for that. How was it going? You know, your, your book, Certainty, is your book. You wrote it. Was it were you like, thank goodness I have a director so you can have that outside yeah. perspective or? Yeah, the, fu the funny thing is, so, you know, I said cr coming up with voices for the characters. <clears throat> When I'm doing somebody else's book, 
I'll come up with a voice. And the voice says, yeah, I'll say to myself, yeah, that sounds good. I like that. That works. Um, and then, But doing my book, there were actually, because the voices of the characters, because I'd written it, were so clear in my head, mm -hmm. there were some voices that I literally could not do. I said, I, I can't do this person's voice. It was very frustrating because I knew what they were supposed to sound like, which is when it's with somebody else's book, you know, I don't. I yeah. you know, I come up with all sorts of ways to create voices. So it's so it was a little more, you know, I, I was a little more precious with my own book. You know, I went back and did things over, you know, and which I probably didn't have to. Yeah. And, um, so it was good to have a director there for sure. How much leeway did they give you on your own book compared to how much leeway they'd give you on, say, someone else's book? Um, I'm not sure. How do you mean leeway? Uh, like when you when you say I want to come up with a voice or, or you know, oh, change, they, they, change something yeah. up or, or, you know, modify something more. If it's like he said, she said, and you want to cut the he said out, did they give you leeway oh, since it was your book? Um, no, you can't make changes like in the text. You want to do the text as is okay. unless you spot something. I mean, every book, no matter how well edited it's been, there are typos in every single book. Um, right. And so if you notice something that's clearly a typo, you can change it, take it, take the liberty to change it. But you definitely want to stick to the text as written. But um, but in terms of voices and stuff, that's completely up to me. Okay. Um, voices, you know, you have general guidelines. Again, you want to keep, if it's a normal book, you want to keep the voices, like generally the main character is closest to your own voice. Okay. And then you sort of go off from there. And like when I do women's voices, I don't like go all the way, you know, really high or try to sound like a woman. I just soften the tone a little bit or, you know, soften the pronunciation or come up with another way to make, make her different than, um, and it, it, you know, it's interesting too, because um, I just did a book when I had to do a bunch of accents and, um, you know, and I, I had to learn, I had to learn how to do some accents. Like I've never been very good at an Indian accent. Yeah. It always ends up winding sounding Irish, but, um, but I, uh, you know, I, I did my research on YouTube, but that's, that's the fun of it. That's really, that really keeps it interesting a lot. I was going to ask you, do you have a source for getting for getting accents and you just said YouTube. <laughs> YouTube, you just, you know, YouTube's a mir miraculous man. You just you say how to speak English with an Indian accent, and like twenty videos will come up. Do you find people coming to you and be like, "Oh, you've got this wrong. Can you fix that?" Or did you not? Do you not get that kind of issue at all? I don't get that. I don't get that much. Um, uh, you know, when I was like, say, Bob's books, The Legend of Drizzt, when I I was approached. Um, they had done four of them before I came on board with two different narrators. Yeah. And I guess people really didn't like the narrators, the way they were pronouncing things. So they went out looking for a new narrator and they went to Audible, who was producing it at the time, publishing them. And so what they did was they chose three narrators to audition for, uh, for the, for the narr narration, the series. At that point, there were, I think there were 25 books. And um, so there were three of us. And they put it on the fan website, Wizards of the Coast, and I won by 53%. Oh, wow. So, um, so, I, the, so the fans really had, you know, a, um, a stake in me doing them. But so now what happens is people will read the first 10 books or so, listen to the first 10 books. And then one of these other narrators who are all fine actors, they, their voice comes up and they say, oh, no, where's Victor? You know, <laughs> they're, used to my, they're used to my voice. Yeah. So we're now trying, I've gotten so many, and Bob has as well, so many hits on Twitter of like, please, when will you, how do we get you to re-record these books? It's just, you've got to do the whole series. Because now I've done almost 40. I've done probably 37 over the last 10 years. Yeah. So now we're trying to find a way to, to actually re-record those books. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. Is there a time frame on that at all that you think of? Or is it just kind of I, in, uh, in this discussion? I, I think, you know, I, I, we're, we're, I just found the right person to talk to, so I don't want to okay. put a time frame on it, but yeah. I, I, think, I think in fairly short order, I think hopefully we'll get it done. That would feel great to be able to do That'll that. That would be great. And I know a lot of people will rebuy those audiobooks, and I'll be one of yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. Um, How was it to know? Uh, let me first, before I ask this question, I'm going to ask you did, were you familiar with his work ahead of time? No. Did somebody just come up to you and be like, "Hey, you want to try out for this for this?" 
Yeah, the out. producer at Audible came up to me and said, "Would you like to Would you like to do this series? Can you commit to it? It's going to probably take two years." Um, and I'll say, I said, "Yeah, I'll commit to it if I get if I have the same studio and the same engineer." Okay. For the entire time, and I basically had the same studio with two different engineers. But they provided me. I don't know if you know a guy named Phil Athens, who's great. He's a, an editor and a writer himself. But he provided me with a whole lexicon of all the words, all the nice. names and places, and to make sure we got them right and we didn't upset the, you know, upset yeah. the. Fans. Well, and that's a with that book series. There are so many names that people so have many. in their mind. Driz, Drizzt alone or Dritz yeah. alone. You know, those are two ways people pronounce it all yeah. the time, and people are always arguing over arguing. the names. And I never, yeah. I, I personally, I was like, does does it matter? I, ha I know there have been so many authors that say. How do you want to pronounce it? You're the reader. But when it comes to audiobooks, that's not an option. Yeah, though sometimes, um, like if there's a new character, I'll ask Bob, what do you want? He said, you know, go go for it, whatever, whatever feels right. Okay. So, um, it really depends on the, the um, depends on the writer. Um, you know, the Hyperion books were really an, an incredible experience. I am... Um, Really, those those stand out as well. They were they're just some extraordinary science fiction. You want to tell uh, our audience a little bit about that those books uh, for those that aren't familiar. Obviously, we the people that are familiar with the show, we've had Bob Salvatore on, so they have an idea of his books. Um, Hyperion is a kind of a sci-fi ish book series, correct? Sci-fi, and it's very. Um, sp um, I mean, Bob's books are very spiritual too, mm -hmm. um, but it's very. Um, I don't know how to. I really, I don't know how to describe them. I mean, the first book, they're they're very they're very dense. They're very literary. Um, they're they're um, they go into really a lot of aspects of religion and faith, and they're they they really go beyond the the average science fiction book in terms of thematically. Okay. And uh, they're very philosophical. The nature of religion, you know, um, and uh, yeah, the first one is multicast. And I was one of the people in that first one. And then the, there are three more. There's Hyperion, Fall of Hyperion, Endymion, and Rise of Endymion. Mm -hmm. So the three, the, the last three books I did as a solo narrator. And, and those are uh, really popular books, too, for those that are yeah, uh, one Hugo Award-winning books. Uh, author is Dan, Dan Simmons. Simmons. Yeah, Dan Simmons. Nice. Yeah. And yeah, I, everything I see, I'm like, man, this looks like an amazing, really, really deep, really deep book. Yeah, they're, they're really deep and they're it's just it's, they're so hard to describe because they they you know one of them the 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 main character is a sort of clone avatar of, of Keats the poet okay you know in the in the 25th century or whatever it is wow. so it's you know there's a lot of a lot of references between these two books I mean those are probably two of your bigger named books probably two of the best-selling books do you have yeah. a book that didn't necessarily isn't as well known but you kind of you kind of think it should be because it was such so well done yeah there was a book by a guy named dennis johnson it was one of the early books that i did called um oh my god i'm gonna forget the name of it now um the guy who wrote uh jesus's son canadian writer dennis johnson uh it's a one-word title. I've forgotten the name of it, but it's a fantastic, amazing book. I think uh, I did a um, a Kurt Vonnegut book, Mother Night, which I think is a fantastic, fantastic book. Um, um, yeah, uh, just so many. I've done so many books. <laughs> it's just hard to. It's hard. I mean, people say, you know, what's your favorite audio book? Right. Say, Certainty. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. My book. <laughs> Makes you know, sense. read most of my book, um, and uh, you know, because I think that's a really, I do think it's a really interesting story and a read, and um, but um, you know, there's a there's a new series that I'm I'm doing, because um, people ask me uh, often because of um, having done Bob's books and that when they finish the series they're anxious for more and so they'll ask me, um, what should I read, right? You know. And so there's a new a new author, a guy named uh, J.V. Hilliard, has a uh, series called the Warminster series. Okay. Um, 
It's the first one is called um, The Last Keeper, and I just did the second one, Voriden's Lair. And they're really, I think they're really, really good and worth definitely worth checking out. There's an interesting series called um, Oracles, um, The Oracle's Queen. Okay. It's a three part series. That's a really interesting. Um, that's some really interesting fantasy stuff. Uh, yeah, there. I mean, there's just so much. I did. I did this. There's this science fiction writer named Dan Torin, who um, they're like. It's like Mission Impossible in space, and they're really fun. The characters are great. I, love I just did another one of those. I mean, we've you know we've got a great um, Driz book coming out that um, Bob put together. That it basically takes all the those journal entries that Drizzt has yeah. at the beginning of the parts of the books. Yeah. And he's put them all together as the Tao of Drizzt. And they're in chronological and order, correct? They're in chronological order, and that's coming out soon. And I, I think I think it's wonderful. I mean, I was really I was really moved by it. And and you know, again, I, I'm I'm I love when I get the chance to for the what I'm doing is communicating something that's a value. Yeah. Um, whether either it's totally entertaining, which is fine, but also something that really has a message that's valuable, that is going to help people in their lives. And I, I feel that with Drizzt. I mean, I feel, you know, all, I, you know, my theory is all great stories are about moral ambiguity. And that's what he faces is, you know, how do I be a good person and, um, you know, in an imperfect world? And um, so I, I think I would really recommend that that one new one, Dow of Driz, when that comes out, and that leads me to the one I did this. It reminded me of uh, one I just did this week, which is um, the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Yeah, that sounds so really Mar- cool. Awesome. Yeah, so Marcus Aurelius was emperor of Rome, you know, two thousand years ago, and was one of the great. He was one of the, known as one of the five five good emperors. Yeah, and um, and for reference, he was the guy that um, that. Uh, uh, Joaquin Phoenix killed in Gladiator, his father. He killed his father. That was Marcus Aurelius. Right. Anyway, he was a real philosopher king, and he used to write a journal himself. And the journal was ultimately published as Meditations. And it's 2,000 years old, but it is so powerful. I mean, it's just, I, I was so honored to do it. Um, and, um, yeah, again, another thing with the, the best, I think the best compliment I ever got is one of the Driz books. Um, it really moved me was um, somebody reached out to me a, a father reached out and he said you know I used to we used to have story time with my kids and I'm going blind and I can't read to them anymore oh. and so now we listen to you reading the, the Driz books together I mean it's like you know that's an I ultimate was, compliment right there I was, I was teary eyed um you can't trade awards for something like for a compliment like that. No, it was it was great. So um, yeah, so I feel like those characters, you know, the 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 you know the legend Driz characters are, my, are really my friends. I'm always happy to do do one of those books when they come up. Do you have a character that stands out to you besides Driz or Driz? I love Jarl. I love Jarl Axel, and um, I can't. I'll tell you a little thing. It's, it's I love his voice. Mm-hmm. And um, and it's funny. I use a little trick for myself because you've got to remember the voices over. Right, and there's so many in that series now. So many, and it's over ten years now that I have to remember. Sometimes a a character will disappear for two books and come back, and so I won't tell you who it is. But I'm so bad at celebrity impersonations that I can do an impersonation, and I'll I'll use it, and I and that's what I did for Gerald Axel. And it's, I get right to the voice instantly, but nobody has any idea who I'm doing. You know? Oh, man. So it's... Uh, now I'm going to have to think about it every next time I, I listen to one. You have to listen to it and think about it, but I don't think you'll ever guess it. It's Because it, it doesn't sound anything like him, but it just is enough of a, a hook for me. Yeah. You know, um, to get it, uh, to just get go right to it. You yeah. know, and I, I love I love Entreri. I think Artist Entreri is great. Um, I love doing, you know, I love doing Bruner and all the dwarfs are great. Um, uh, you know, um, Rumble Belly is awesome. <laughs> yeah, they're all, they're all great. They're just great. They're great characters. And, and, you know, it's, 
it's remarkable how um, yeah, because yeah, you know, we all know ultimately they're going to be okay. They just yeah. it's the it's just in that it's just the nature of the genre. But to be able to know that and have the tension build throughout them, which does, which he right. does, which is you know is it's fantastic. You know, I think at this point more characters have come back than than have yeah. died. <laughs> exactly. Um, Do you you know we were talking off podcast about you just recently did a Rainbow Six. Um, wasn't story. recent. It wasn't recent. It was about four years ago. I did the original. Vo the original. I'm, I'm Cap Can in Rainbow Six. If anybody plays it, okay. And I didn't know. About a year and a half after I did it, they brought me back in. Okay. To do updates, and the guy from Canada, because it was uh, Ubisoft, which is based in Canada, a French guy said, "Do you have any idea how popular you are?" <laughs> you have two million followers on Capcan. He's very popular. So I've had people reach out to me on Twitter and ask for like a birthday message in Capcan's voice. Oh, nice. And um, I actually did it once. Now I'm going to have a million requests. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to set up a, a cameo to do that. Yeah, exactly. That. Exactly. I should do that. Has um, there ever been thought of, you know, there are the the characters from Salvatore's books have been immortalized in video games. Has there ever been a talk about having you come in and do the voice for them in any of the video games? Or is that something you'd be up for doing? I'd be up for doing it. Nobody's in. I've never been asked that. And um, of course, I get asked all the time, when is this one of these going to be movies? And, you know, on that, you know, I don't I don't think Bob doesn't know. And, you know, right. and, um, but I think someday they will be. They have to be. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Even, and if I they, was even if they just be animated movies and then you yeah. do all the voices. Yeah, and I was, always, I was always a huge fan of Lord of the Rings. Yeah, so it, it was a you know a natural sequence for me. But we should we should talk a little bit about parkour. Yeah, yeah, sure. We could definitely talk. But I wanted to talk a little bit about your book too. Okay, sure. Uh, um, since we're talking so about books and, and that, tell us about Certainty. Uh, it is an amazing story, and it's based off of stuff that happened in real life, right? Yeah, yeah, I. Again, I um, I'm fascinated by the idea of moral ambiguity. Yeah, and um, so I discovered I was walking down Lower Manhattan one day, and it was pouring rain. I ducked in a bookstore, and I picked up this book of historical essays, and I saw this event, and it was basically 1919 Newport, Rhode Island, um, 1918, right in the middle of the Spanish flu. Okay. <clears throat> the Newport was very overcrowded because they were training sailors for World War One, and and. Uh, there was just a lot of, you know, you know, these young kids, they were just, they had no outlet. And, and so there was a lot of sort of not so um, respectable behavior going on. Yeah. And so the Navy decided they wanted to put a stop to it. So they um, actually, what they did was they recruited 25 good looking young sailors, sent them undercover into the gay community with orders to have sex with other guys in order to entrap them. True. Yeah. Um, went on for six months, they arrested 17 sailors and they started going after civilians and they arrested the Sophiscal priest who was a really prominent member of the Newport community, community, community. And when, when he went to trial, it became a national scandal and it almost wrecked FDR's career because he had un approved the operation as undersecretary of the Navy. So what my book deals with is it deals with the trial of the priest and the lawyer who defends him. The lawyer is really the main character. Okay. And then you get to know five of the undercover sailors and, you know, these guys who presumably were straight, you know, who go undercover to do this. So it's it's really an examination and of what appropriate and inappropriate behavior is, depending on where you're coming from, depending on because you've got sort of three groups. You've got the clergy, you've got the sailors, and you've got the sort of local bourgeoisie. Yeah. You know, all of whom think they know what is right and wrong. And everybody comes in this crucible and, and is their ideas are turned upside down. So um, it started as a screenplay. I wrote it first as a screenplay. It was almost made in 2008 and the financial crisis hit and we lost the money. Um, but I think eventually it will be. So I, I, I had always wanted to write a novel and so I just said then, now's the time to write a novel. Yeah. Um, so um, it's gotten great, great customer reviews on Amazon and we sold about 10,000 copies, which is pretty good for a first novel. Um, and um, and I'm working on my next one. Nice. Is it going to be 
based no. on something real or complete no, fiction? No, uh, I mean, in in in, I mean, it's fiction, but it's based based on real stuff that's going on in the world. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Well, I definitely will want to hear about that, and we'll yeah. promote it on our socials and all cool. that. I definitely want to uh, take a crack. So you wait. So you mentioned that you made it for a screenplay, right? Yeah. So, you know, we haven't really mentioned it. You also an actor for years. Yeah. Yeah. Doing doing shows. I mean, pretty much every TV show known to man from the '80s on through now, you've been on. What What's that like? Is it just a roller coaster to go and be on all these different sets and just be a you know whether it's a walk on character or a reoccurring character? Yeah. Um. I you know I started out. I got very lucky early, and I I I went off to a boarding school. I got a you know full scholarship to go to this boarding school in New Hampshire, and there had been a book that was written about the school called A Separate Piece. And Paramount came, I was there like two months and Paramount came to do the movie. And I was cast as one of the leads in the movie. Okay. So my career started pretty like, you know, outsized when I was 16 years old. Um, and then, you know, I had a long career. I did a lot of, a lot of theater in New York. Uh, I was on a soap for a year, um, did a lot of recurring stuff on, on TV shows in LA. And, and, you know, I think cause I, in a way, cause I started so young I was starting to get bored with being in the, you know, actors are always waiting to get hired. Yeah. And I wanted to be more, more sort of at the helm. Okay. Um, so I, I did wind up directing two, two movies. And I was supposed to direct Certainty well, when we lost the money. But I did a, a low budget feature and a, and a short film that I wrote and directed. Okay. And um, yeah, I, you know, directing is, I mean, acting is great, directing is great. Um, just, I love storytelling. You know, it's it really, and that's what I, and that kind of brings us around to parkour. How I discovered parkour is I was working with at-risk youth. I was working with a couple of nonprofits. Yeah. And myself and my and my you know, writing partner at the time, and um, uh, and you know it was we were, you know, using the hero's journey to reach to reach these kids, and and then I discovered I turned on the radio once in two thousand in two thousand six. And there was a piece on parkour and they were talking about how kids were getting the metaphor they were overcoming physical obstacles they could overcome other obstacles as well and i yeah. said i have to do something with this and and it also reminded me i used to have this recurring nightmare when i was five that i was being chased by a t-rex and the only way i could get away was my arms would lengthen and i'd push myself like a monkey okay and, and that's the kong vault in parkour and they started yeah. talking about it and i said so we were able to get um we were able to get a show on MTV in 2010 called MTV's Ultimate Parkour Challenge. And then that started us on the road to build the infrastructure for the sport. And so we offer insurance and and equipment and uh, curriculum and we do events around the world. Um, it's, the company's called WFPF, World Free Running Parkour Federation. And it's um, it's been great, man. I mean, you know, it's been it's been hard. Sometimes I wish I never turned on the radio that day. but. <laughs> But it's been um, we've done a lot of good for a lot of people around the world. And we also have a nonprofit and we've been helping. We had a very big federation in Afghanistan, really, really strong. And they were teaching women. And um, and then when the Taliban came, they were at risk. So we've been working with like five athletes to get them out and get them to safety. Okay. Um, anyway, so. Um, so, yeah, so hopefully that's going to keep growing. It's How a great it to see that boom in, you know, you see it on heck, I think one of the first first major films was a Bond movie. You get to see Bond chasing someone doing parkour yeah. through it. How yeah. is that for I mean, did you guys have a boom from stuff like that from from all the media attention? We, we you know, we did, but the the problem has been with that is everybody knows at this point what parkour is. Pretty much everybody knows what it is. Yeah. But it's convincing them that it's not about jumping off buildings. Right that's the hype that you see on and it's great it's great media to, content to see some great teams out there doing that stuff the extreme stuff but it's so valuable to do it you know and and so valuable for kids i mean our 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 biggest demographic we have about 60 gyms are in the us and canada and, and mexico that we work with and then athletes around the world and it's just such a positive thing for kids that the the biggest demographic vast growing demographic are 5 to 12 year olds so it's convincing people that this can be done safely um, and you don't have to jump off buildings. Right. So as much as the hype is good, it leads people kind of down the wrong 
direction. Well, and you say athletes, I mean, the health benefits and a lot of people do things like yoga for stretching, but I mean, you need to have good flexibility and, and good, yeah. you know, you know, a, a, a muscle tension and uh, cardio. And that just, it just helps a person's personal health. I, I looked at it a handful of times and I'm like, I should really get into that because gosh, I can't, yeah. you know, I get out of the car and I'm like, oh gosh, my legs, my back, and you can, my whatever. And we have adult classes. We even have, we even have a program we work with in, in Washington DC area that works with seniors. Oh wow. It's like, it's called PK Silver and it's about fall prevention. It's helping learn, helping them learn. Cause it's, you know, parkour can be done at any age and it's about going from A to B, yeah. you know, the art of going from A to B. And, um, and it's, um, you know, and it also for kids, it tends to appeal to a lot of outsiders, kids who don't normally go to traditional sports. A lot of gamers love parkour and wind up getting into it. So it's a lot of kids who wouldn't normally be athletic, who don't want to be in like hyper, like intense little league or football or yeah. so they go in the, and they find a real community. And as opposed to other um, extreme sports, it's really not a daredevil sport. It's really about you know, working within your limits to grow your abilities. Yeah. And you'll never see one parkour athlete say to another, I dare you to do that. Yeah. So, um, so it's a, it's a super positive thing. Yeah. It kind of reminds me, I mean, a little bit of almost like the modern, you know, in, in the nineties, there was skateboarding was pretty big. Yeah. And, you know, Tony Hawk was a huge influence in yeah. helping kids and, and yeah. being healthy and being a good human being and all that kind of stuff. And it really reminds me of that for modern yeah. day yeah sometimes we say it's skateboarding without the skateboard well there we go see see yeah. i love my analogies and when they work and, and come together like <laughs> how much do you physically do do you go out there and do it yourself or do you uh, just kind of run the program and, and I just the, it? I mean, i'm very active physically i go to the gym all the time and mm -hmm. i've been doing yoga since i was 18. um i used to do stuff like it when i was a kid but um and I've learned how to do a Kong vault. So nice. that, that was good. So I had to get that out of my system, but I, I, you know, I've always said, I want it. I would like to start when I have the time. Um, but I, you know, I'm always so busy, you right. know, sort of building the, building the program. So. Yeah, definitely. How many, how many different countries are you guys in? We're yeah. probably we have a presence in probably 70 countries. That's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I was looking at your, uh, the website um, yeah. and again guys that's world free running parkour federation wfpf and the, the list of people you have like just looking at the list i'm like hey i recognize that person oh i've seen that person before whether it's you know youtube videos or yeah. you know shows or or whatever it's it's really cool to see the athletes that you have there do they have like competitions for that oh yeah um yeah you should go on um Go on the WFPF, the World Parkour Championship. So if you type in World Parkour Championship, Marden, M-A-R-D-I-N, 2018. Um, and it's a, it's a YouTube site, World Parkour Championship. And you'll see the big event we did in Marden, Turkey, right before the pandemic. Okay. And it, it's amazing. It's amazing. And, and, it, and the great thing is we were able to bring athletes by going over there we were able to bring athletes into the into the community that really had never been seen before like iran has a huge parkour community okay and so there were 11 people from iran and, and two of them were women they were they were competing in hijabs nice how and how do they grade it, oh, go pardon ahead. me go ahead, go and ahead. We did it on the top we did it on the top of a 14th century madrasa and speaking of video games all the athletes got there and they were some of the top athletes in the world and our, our, what we try to do is we try to bring some of the top guys and girls, and then we, we have local qualifiers so we can bring them, the local people into it. So when they got there, the top guys got to the, um, uh, got to the rooftop. They said, oh my God, this is Assassin's Creed, <laughs> which is totally, which is totally parkour. Yeah. Yeah. And, for sure. um, so, but now we're planning, you know, we got set back by the pandemic, but now we're planning to. 2023 will have like a bunch of events again. Excellent. How do they grade the athletes on that? 
generally there's there are pretty it varies depending on whose competition it is but generally there's two rounds there's a speed round which is the original nature of parkour was the fastest most efficient way from point a to point b okay and then since we're not getting chased by tigers anymore there is also um uh, the, the the creative round so you find the most creative line from point A to point B, often using martial arts tricks and flips and, and um, uh, gymnastics, breakdancing, moves from other, other disciplines you pull into it, but it's, it's about flow, um, you're judged on flow and on um, versatility, difficulty execution and um, creative use of the environment. Awesome. Again, everyone listening, World Free Running Parkour Federation, check it out it is super cool and how many people do you have that partnered with you to get that up and running um well for a while it was really just me and my two business partners okay forever and now um one of them became a silent partner and then we got another guy on board um so it's david thompson is one of the original my original partner and then robbie corbett is an amazing guy and he's he's they're He's a parkour athlete and has been for years, and so he he sort of run, runs the competitions. And and then we've got probably, so it's the three of us are the main people, and then okay. there's probably a team of like 10 or 12 other consultants and people we, we call on for, depending on what we're doing. And then again, we have partner gyms around, like about 60 partner gyms that we work with in North America. Okay. That's awesome. How many... Um... How much do you split your time between audiobooks and the parkour? Like, is it literally spend, like your entire uh, day? Or I spend about eighty hours a week on parkour and about eighty hours a week on audiobooks. <laughs> <laughs> no, it fifteen tends, minutes on sleep. Yeah, it tends to come in like waves. Okay. Um, like I'll have like I just did five audiobooks in a row while I was in California, so that was five weeks. I was doing mostly that. Now I have a, a, a about a month off, and so I'll really focus on stuff we need to do for the company. Okay. Um, the trick is I just got to get back into my writing schedule because I really, you know, I want to. I got to write. I want to write my next book. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, hey, certainly, certainty is now available in both book form and audio book form. Uh, you guys can find it on Audible. You can also find it on Victor Bavine's website. You're on Twitter at Victor Bavine, also on Instagram at Victor Bavine. Those, those are correct, right? Yes. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks for joining us. If you want to stick around, we're going to go to some live stream questions. And hey. uh, those who are listening to the audio or to the podcast, I'm like, my brain's on audiobook form right now. It's like audiobooks. We're talking about them. Um, those that are listening to the podcast form, please stick around and Make sure to rate and review us, follow us, and all of those things. But at first, I want to tell you, October 3rd, we're going to be joined by tabletop game giant Steve Jackson from Steve Jackson Games. Be it Munchkin, Gerbs, Hack and Slash, or any of the other hundreds of popular games, we will talk about it. That's going to be live October 3rd or in podcast form on October 4th. October 17th, hip-hop singer Nerd D will be joining us to talk about his music and how his music is influenced by his life growing up as a geek and a nerd in the world. Uh, that's going to be October 17th. The podcast will be available on the 18th. So be sure to check out our past episodes with the likes of Ari Salvatore and Ray Porter and all of our other amazing guests we've had in the past. As I said, rate and review. Give us those five stars. It helps us and helps our guests. So for the amazingly talented Victor Bavine, I am Nick, and I'd like to thank you all for listening to Epic Realms. <laughs>